with the ABCs of salvation. So we are looking for the soon return of Jesus. And as we do that, we want to make sure that we're ready to see him face to face. And the only way that we are prepared is if we have Jesus as our savior. And that is Jesus that is God almighty who came and put on flesh and dwelt among us and paid the price for our sins. Salvation is in the finished work of Jesus on the cross alone. And so Jesus said it himself that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. And so um, God is a Trinitarian. He's a Trinity. Um, God is one God forever existing in three persons. And exactly how this works, we won't know until we see Jesus face to face, and that's okay. There's some things that are very finite minds cannot understand an infinite God, but one day we'll see him face to face and we'll understand. But in the meantime, salvation is found in the finished work of Jesus. It's not our righteousness. Our righteousness is filthy rags. Our righteousness cannot produce life, but we become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. And so salvation is key in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So tonight we're going to look at new anti-Semitism. And, and really what it is, is that there's nothing new under the sun. That, you know, this is a, what we're seeing today in Israel with Hamas and Hezbollah and the Arab League and, and just seems like the whole world, it doesn't seem like it is, the whole world is trying to figure out what to do with this tiny little slither of real estate. And this even smaller capital inside that tiny little slither of real estate, Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem is the center of the world as God said it would be. And he said in the last days that this is the way it would be, that all nations would be trying to figure out what to do with Jerusalem and that they would be cut to pieces as a result of it. So today, as we see this anti-Semitism growing, this, this hatefulness growing against the children of God and the people that God has called by his name, we're going to look at that tonight and we're going to see why every believer should care about Jesus, why it is a natural characteristic of a child of God to love Israel, the people of Israel. And uh, for me personally, it's it's a love that doesn't even make sense. I I love Israel and, you know, practically I can look at it and I can say, well, I'm, I'm very appreciative. I appreciate and I am so thankful that God entrusted them with his word, with his scripture. And I am so thankful that God entrusted them with his line, the line to Jesus. And I am so thankful that the promises that God has given to Israel, he's going to keep those promises, just like he's going to keep those, the promises that he has given to the Gentiles, that he's given to his church. And so I'm very, very thankful. But honestly, I believe the Holy Spirit inside of believers is really what makes us love Israel the way that we do. Because if you love God and you love his story and you love what he's done, then you love the people that are the centerpiece of his story. And I think the main root of anti-Semitism is people not knowing his story, not caring about the full counsel of God's word. And so if you don't know this, it's very difficult for you to understand what's going on in the world uh, from a biblical point of view, because you don't care about a biblical point of view. And I think that's what we see all around are people that have no idea what's going on and they can't get their head around it because it doesn't make sense unless you're looking at it from a biblical worldview. So today we have this, um, we, 
we have a real problem with wise fools. This is one thing that just, you know, you see them on TikTok. They are so smart and they've got this figured out and they're just spewing the most ridiculous lies that they heard from some professor or they heard from, but there's this epidemic of wise fools. And Romans 1, 21 through 22, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And uh, really the entire, you know, first chapter of Romans is just, it sounds like Paul just looked through a veil at today and wrote about what we see every day. But here, this is talking about, and this is making it very clear that there's no, no one really has an excuse. God has revealed himself to some extent to every human being. Now, many people reject him and they grasp at these lies. They grasp at these wise fools that mock and make fun of the things of God because they want an excuse. But God's very clear that there is no excuse. So God has revealed himself to everyone through his creation. And God goes on to explain how man's sin and man's preference to stay in sin, that because of that, they stay in darkness. When they should start to seek the creator, they decide to stay in darkness. They're given over then to this reprobate mind. So the more they want to stay there, the more they are clinging to all these lies, they are given over to this reprobate mind to where they can't make sense. You know, you look at the debate here with Hamas and, and Palestinians that are raised to hate, raised to view Jews as, as subhuman. And then you look at the arguments for how there should be no consequences for that, that Israel should just, basically Israel should just be okay with dying. They should just die and be quiet about dying. That that's, that's a reprobate mind. There's makes no sense whatsoever. You wouldn't do that. If you had a neighbor that constantly kept coming over to your house and trying to shoot your family, you would do something about that neighbor. You wouldn't just allow it to continue to happen. But there's the reason is out the window um, when people are given over to a reprobate mind. So it's like Paul peered into the future and he saw today with the state of of um, the state of people. And, it, and it's not just with Israel. We see this reprobate mind everywhere with identity politics. Um, the sexual revolution, we see this reprobate mind all over the place, but it's especially strong in schools um, and, and in large cities and places where people are, are really given over to listening to these wise fools. So today we're bombarded by this. People, and the thing is, people know that something's wrong. They know something isn't right. But without a biblical understanding and without a biblical worldview, they're just grasping at conspiracies and they're stumbling over the truth, but they don't want to go to the truth, the simplicity that God is real and the Bible is actually his word. Instead, they, get, they allow themselves to get veered off and to go down these rabbit holes of conspiracy theories. And so we're seeing that take over every direction. Um, but right now, what happened on, uh, on October 7th was extremely tragic. I mean, there's no way to put into words how tragic um, this war is. And this is a Holocaust. This is a Holocaust. And it's the worst um, thing that's happened to Israel since the Holocaust. And, but it was also a very prophetic day. And um, looking at this as someone that's been watching Israel and been watching for Jesus for, for, for a long time now, um, you know, we weren't really that surprised. We were surprised and shocked by 
the magnitude of the evil, you know, this evil is shocking and it should be. It's, it's appalling and ridiculous how evil this is. But we weren't shocked that it happened because we've actually been looking for it to happen. We've been watching. We've been expecting it. I mean, just about every month at some point we talk about how Israel is about to see these wars. And we were just speculating on whether it would happen while we're still here or whether everything would continue to hold. Because remember, we kept, you know, I, I kept saying it's so strange because we see all the pieces coming together, but then it holds. And I wasn't sure if it would just hold until after the restrainer's gone, after we're gone and then break through. But we see it broke through concerning Israel, concerning this war. Um, and it broke through on the last great day, the eighth day. Shemini Atzeretz of the Feast of Tabernacles. So the day that it broke through was also very prophetic because again, and it's like God was underlining the 50 because it was exactly 50 years from the Yom Kippur War. And so here again, on a high holy day, the enemy came in and attacked Israel when they were supposed to be, when it when's the day that Israel dedicates to worshiping God and drawing back to God and returning to God, that's the day that the enemy decided to target the children of God. And so it's very interesting that he did that. But but understand all these all these are prophetic timing. And this was a huge wake up call. So second Peter and Peter is saying this right after he says a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. And we don't know exactly what day it is. You know? And we don't know exactly what year it is. Even it seems, you know, with the way that the calendars and everything gets so messed up, but we know we're very near year 6,000 and man has been given 6,000 years. When 7,000 year dawns, that's the millennial reign of Christ. So all of this has to get buttoned up um, before that happens. And so here's 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so this is something that really jumped out at me. And so there's a few things that I feel has kind of been underlined this past week. And God continues to underline that the woman is in travail, that that was a key. That was something that I had missed before, just how strong. And I know we had talked about Israel being the woman and, and, and the birth pains and all being tied to her, but understanding that Israel being in travail is also a sign of the very last moments before the tribulation begins before, you know, and as the tribulation begins, she's in travail. And so that means we are raptured while she is in travail. And then another thing here is that there's a wake up call. And I was thinking about the trumpet blast, you know, and here on the last great day, it, you know, there's the trumpet blast. There's a trumpet blast for, ta for tabernacles. You know, the trumpets, we, we always think about the trumpets, especially being associated with Rosh Hashanah. Trumpets are associated with so many things, with a call to war, a call to come home from war, um, you know, a call to attention, a call to assembly. Uh, trumpet, trumpets are used all the time, but they are, they are a wake-up call. And we see this wake-up call that happened on October 7th. And understanding here, the Lord is not slack. He is coming for his bride, but he's also long suffering and he doesn't want any to perish. He doesn't want anyone to miss out on that opportunity of coming to repentance. And we're still waiting on brothers and sisters. We're still waiting on portions of the bride to come in. And that's what we've seen with this wake up call. There have been people asking questions that we're, we're, you know, we talked about the frogs in a boiling pot. You know? We had people asking questions that were comfortable before, but this kind of sparked their interest and they're saying, well, hold on a minute. This looks biblical. 
And so people are asking questions. People in Israel are asking questions. You know, I'm hearing, I believe Amir said something about it. And there were, uh, there were some other people from Israel that were saying that um, the Christians in Israel are having opportunities to talk about Jesus with people that were really a closed door beforehand. But because this is happening, they're saying, okay, tell me about Jesus again. Tell me about this end time scenario that you were talking about before. And so Jesus is coming soon. And we are in the Bible. You know, we are literally living in the Bible. And when something like this happens, it shakes people out of their slumber to where they stop and they realize, hold on a minute, where are we in time? Is the Bible true? You know, Israel is this huge neon sign that not only are we in the last days, but that God is real, that the Bible is real. Israel, Israel is this huge neon sign that this is true. And so we see Jacob's trouble. We see it already happening. And we know it's going to get so much worse during the tribulation period. But we're close to seeing our king. And this is God's wake up call. God doesn't want any to perish. And so there's people asking questions. They can see that this is biblical. Even people that have never touched a Bible, they've got something inside of them that's like, this is biblical. Israel is saying, this is biblical. This is a biblical proportions. Jesus is coming back and Satan knows that Jesus is coming back. That's one reason why, and that his time is very short. That's why he's so bold. The demons know it. And the bride knows it too. The bride of Christ has been watching for him and she cannot wait to see him. She's excited for him and she knows the time is short. Um, and I believe everybody that has the Holy Spirit has that spark inside of them that knows he's about to come back. Now, maybe some people have just kind of drowned it with world or, or, or kind of stuffed it down because of fear or whatever other reason. But I think if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you got to know it's about time. So the spirit and the bride say, this is Revelation twenty two seventeen. 17. The spirit and the bride say, come and let him who hears say, come and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. And so we are literally living in the Bible. You know, I love this meme, you know, best start believing in Bible stories. You're in one, <laughs> you know. You, my friend, are in the Bible right now. You know, you, one day when we get to heaven, there's going to be Bible heroes. You're going to be asking them about their life and they're going to want to know what it was like to live right on the edge of the rapture. What it was, what was it like to live right before the tribulation started? Because you are living literally in the Bible. The Bible is happening all around us. Um, and many are, are starting to wake up from that sleep. Romans 13, 11, do this, knowing that this is a critical time. It is already the hour for you to awaken from your sleep, from a spiritual complacency. And I think that right there is a huge issue today, a spiritual complacency. For our salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed in Christ. And I mean, that's true every single day, but all the more today, because our salvation, our literal seeing him face to face is very, very soon. So I'm hearing that believers in Israel are being asked about Jesus. Unbelievers everywhere are asking questions. They're trying to figure this out. So believers who have been lured to sleep by the cares of this world are picking up their heads and they're opening their Bibles to see what God says about something other than themselves. And this sounds kind of cheeky, but this this is something that's really been that's really been on my heart lately. Is that I think a lot of Christians are in spiritual complacency because they haven't been in their Bible to find God, but they've been in their Bible because they're trying to use it as an instruction manual. And, and we'll say that even we'll say, oh, you know, the Bible, that's your instructions for life while on earth. And no, it, it, actually, the Bible's not about you. 
Now there is information in the Bible for you. There is, but it's not about you. It's about God. And when we have the mindset of reading the Bible so we can make our flesh look better, we're going to miss out and we're not going to understand what's happening around us because it's all about us. And especially in the American church, especially in the Western world, that's the way that most people have even been taught to read their Bible is to look for themselves. And so um, this is my devotional <laughs> caution. Um, not that there's anything wrong with devotions. There's not anything wrong with the devotion. But if you count reading a morning devotion as your Bible reading for the day, you're, you are spiritually starving to death. You might as well have a Twizzler every morning and call that your, your, your four, you know, your meals and call that a balanced diet because that's all you're getting. If all you're getting is a devotion because by and large, the majority of devotionals are about making your flesh feel better. And, and it's not that that's bad if it's supplemented with you actually opening up the book and reading Genesis to Revelation on a regular basis. If you're actually reading the Bible to read the Bible, it's not bad to have a devotion, but if all you're getting is a devotion, then you're malnourished and you're going to have a really hard time understanding what's happening in the world around you because you're not seeking the author of the book. You're seeking how to make yourself feel better. And when you seek the author of the book, this amazing things happen. This amazing thing happens that you actually start to feel better <laughs> because it's not about you. And the more we feed the flesh, the more the flesh becomes this monster. And I know that very, very well. So if your main source of Bible is from devotions, you're going to miss out on understanding the purpose of God's word. God's word is not given so your flesh can look better. It's not given as a self-help book. That's not what the Bible is. The Bible isn't about you. It's about God. And the Bible needs to be read in its entirety. You can't just chicken peck through the Bible. It is God's story. It's his, his story, history. Satan doesn't really mind if we know some scripture. And this is something I really want to underline here. Satan doesn't care if you know some scriptures out of context. Think about how many con how many cults right now have the Bible. They usually have the King James Bible, and then they have the Book of Mormon right next to it, or you know, or they've tweaked it. You know, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you've just tweaked the Bible um, to fit to fit the cult. But a lot of cults they have scripture. Satan is not afraid of scripture as long as it's not actually read in context. You think about the music today, the Christian music today that has just completely been taken over by paganism. They'll sing parts of scripture. Satan's not afraid of scripture. What he is afraid of is people that read their Bible in its context and know it. And so Satan can twist scripture if all we know are sound bites out of context. And he's really good at that. And he loves to do that. He did that to Jesus. Remember when he tempted Jesus, Satan spoke scripture to him, but he twisted it out of context. And so that that's a big, big thing of what he does. So we have to be aware of his tactics and we have to really know the Bible for ourselves in its context, not what it tells us about ourselves as much as what it tells us about God. And so the enemy's tactics here, Satan knows that his time is short. And that's one reason we see him so boldly today, because he knows it's time. And I'll tell you right now, the reason that Hamas is acting the way that they are, the reason that Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, that whole Arab League, Iran, Russia, the reason why all of them are acting the way they are is because the demonic spirits that are behind them and are influencing them believe it's time. They believe it's time. They believe they're going to be successful because they also have an eschatology. 
an eschatology of chaos, order out of chaos, right? The enemy all the way around the world, order out of chaos is his MO and what he's looking for. So Satan hates God. Therefore, he hates God's chosen people. If you are, um, if you're anti-Semitic, if you hate the Jewish people, or if you just don't like the Jewish people, if you, if you enjoy the conspiracies about how the Jews rule, rule the world and all those kinds of those, those rabbit trails you can go down, if that's fun for you, then you have to stop and think about it. Where, what's this feeding? Because Satan and the demonic entities, they are the ones that hate God's people. It's not that there's no truth in any of those conspiracies. That's not the point. Where is the motive coming? Because anti-Semitism, that is strictly from hell. So he wants to poke God in the eye because God says, he who touches you, he who touches Israel, touches the apple of his eye. So Satan not only wants to poke God in the eye, but he wants to influence us. He wants to influence people, God's creation, to go and poke God in his eye by going after Israel. And so understand when you do that, when you go after Israel, when you spread these lies, when you when you go off into these crazy these crazy rabbit holes that are that are anti-Israel. Um, no, you're you're trying to poke God in the eye. So he wants people to go against God. And so he's got some tactics. The enemy has his same old tired tactics, but people keep on falling for them over thousands of years. So he'll keep doing it. So tactic number one is this ancient demonic hatred. There is truly nothing new underneath the sun. Ever since there was a Hebrew, people hated them. <laughs> That's just because Satan hates the things that God is doing. And if you love God and if you are actually following him, then Satan hates you. And he's going to throw some stumbling blocks in front of you too. But understanding that, first of all, God was trying to stop uh, Satan. Sorry, Satan was trying to stop God's plan. Because God was going to bring the Messiah. God did bring the Messiah in through Israel. So first, Satan tried to stop him from being able to bring the Messiah in in the first place. Well, that happened. So he can't stop that now. But God promised that the Messiah would come back to the children of Israel to save them. And that he would keep all his promises. And that they would be a great nation. And the millennial kingdom is all is them actually having what he promised them thousands of years ago. And so the enemy is all about trying to stop. He couldn't stop Jesus' first coming. Well, now he's going to try to stop the whole reason for his second coming. So here are Psalms 120, 5 through 7. Woe is me that I dwell at Meshish, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. My soul has dwelt too long with those who hate me. Oh, sorry, with one who hates peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. You know, there's nothing new. That's the same exact spirit that's been there for thousands of years. <clears throat> and this is why Hamas and the enemies of Israel are so emboldened. They believe it's time and that this is the time that they'll be successful. There's truly nothing new under the sun. Satan has been influencing people to try to eliminate God's chosen line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob since the beginning. And those who are influenced by this have been brainwashed since children, have been brainwashed since they were just children to believe that Jews are less than human. You know, we have to understand that in Gaza, in, in um, Palestinian neighborhoods, in a lot of these um Arab the in in the Arab League and a lot of those nations, children are are raised to to believe that Jews are not even human, that they're less than human. If you believe someone is less than human, and then you don't feel as bad about the horrible atrocities that they did. 
And that's one reason why there's all these horrible riots all over the world and in universities. You just, I mean, right now, sending your child to a university is just like handing them over to Satan. I, I mean, these places are just, they have been completely infiltrated by the enemy. And they, they, they are rabid in universities. In cities, um, we see what's happening in, in Europe and in London and France. And they want to just say you can't you can't even sympathize with Israel because that would be humanizing them. And they don't want Israel humanized. And that's this this ancient hatred. And understanding too, the people, and one thing we have to keep very, we have to keep in balance is that the war is not with the people. The people are, are really victims of this. Now, everybody's responsible for their own decisions and everybody's responsible for what they will allow themselves to believe. And everyone is without excuse because God does reveal and he does show. But, um, you know, they have been raised in this hatred. And we see here from Gallant, this is a war between light and darkness. And that's absolutely true. It is a war between light and darkness. Now, I'm not saying that that everything that Israel does and everything that the Israeli government does is righteous. Again, that's not the point here. This is a war between light and darkness because the real war is a spiritual war. This is, make no mistake, this is spiritual warfare. This is Satan going after God. That is the whole purpose of this. And so we see right now, and and this is, I mean, I would have slide after slide after slide of this uprising that's coming against Israel and coming against truth, where there are huge um, thousands upon thousands of people that are gathering together and protesting Israel. And instead of Instead of realizing the atrocities that's happened, they are waving Hamas flags and and they are they're even chanting um, horrible things about Israel and about the Jewish people. And so you just see you see the evil coming to the surface. And so we see here um, in the schools, this is actually from a teacher. Then understand, you know, this right here, when you see this graphic, this is specifically, this is the way Hamas came into Israel to, to massacre. This is, this is how, this is what they did. Some of them coming in to behead babies and burn children and rape, rape women and do the atrocities that they did. This is how they came in and did it. So when you see people wearing this, this is evil. And here, this is this is growing more and more popularity, this, because they, you know, this is the way that they came into Israel to do these things. And so here they're calling for Jews to be wiped out. And so we see this, um, this hatred growing. And so this is, again, this is nothing new. This is not, this is, this is new because this is a heightened, um, a heightened level of inhumanity that's been used. It's a heightened level of evil and demonic um, that we haven't seen in the past. Um, really, the things that are happening are actually more severe than even what the Holocaust did. And the, the Holocaust, because of its numbers, is much worse. But the atrocities and how personal the attacks were, and um, the, that's much, even, even more evil even more evil than the things that were done. And so, but here we see David versus Goliath. And that's the way that God likes to do the battles. And he will do that once again. You know, it's looking right now, it's just this teeny tiny little sliver against the entire Arab League is what it's coming to. You know, if this is Psalm 83 and it continues to look like it's shaping up more and more to be that, um, but regardless if it is or not, this is what we have. We have little slither Israel against the entire known Arab world at this time. And we know 
at the end of the tribulation, it'll be Israel against the entire world, against every nation. So, but some examples of the ancient hate here, um, the Egyptian slavery, murdering of the Hebrew babies, Various attacks during the 40 years in the desert, they were constantly being attacked. Uh, the Philistines, you know, Palestine, the whole name, the, the name, there was never a Palestine. It, the Rome, Rome, after they took Israel in 70 AD, their custom was to rename the land after the land's arch enemy, which was the Philistines. The Philistines had already been gone, but they named it Philistine. Um, and it kind of transliterated to Palestine over the years, they named it that um, as a slap in the face to the Jews to try to make the name of Israel no longer in remembrance. You know, the enemies tried to do that all along. The Babylonian exile, the attempted Holocaust during Esther's day, attempted defeat during Nehemiah's time when he was trying to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, the Roman occupation, Attempted murder of all the boy babies when Jesus was born, destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. And then again, um, I think it was 120 something or 130 something AD is when they had another revolt trying to take it back. Um, attempted murder again, of all the boy babies, 70 AD, scattering of the people and renaming Jerusalem. And then medieval Europe blame the Jews for killing Jesus, and they use that to persecute them. Again, this is all Satan. You know, it's always Satan behind it He perse to persecute them if they did not convert to Catholicism. And so violent persecution in the 19th century, in the 20th century, a lot of that was Russia um, and, and other, um, other European nations as well. Um, and then in various and, and throughout in various um, countries, the, the Holocaust killing six million Jews continued anti-Semitism across the globe in recent history. And since Israel's regathering, they have had constant battles and have had to learn to live under threat of terrorism, uh, under threat of terrorism as normal. You know, here you have this little slither of land where all the citizens have to have access to bunkers. Why? Because their neighbors keep throwing missiles at them over and over and over again. And their government keeps falling for this lie that, oh, well, if you just give us a little bit more land, we won't use it to get closer to you so we can throw more missiles at you. We'll give you peace. And then over and over and again, they give up land and the enemy completely um, gets closer to do just that, to throw more missiles at them. But also the land that they have, the land that um, that's taken over, they use that to, to completely brainwash and indoctrinate future generations of young people to hate Israel. And so this has been normal. So no wonder now after this escalation of hatred, the people are like, no, this is over. We're not doing this anymore. This is it. We're tired of it. And so they've reached their pinnacle to where they're saying they're not going to go back to land for peace lies. They're no longer going to do it. Now we know they will do it again because the Bible says that they will. Something will happen. There's going to be some reason, so much pressure by the world government that they will do this covenant with death and they'll feel for a little bit like they have a false peace, just long enough for Ezekiel 38 um, and 39 to happen to come in. So um, we have this ancient evil, this ancient spiritual warfare. So as evil as this hatred is, Remember, this is a spiritual battle. These people are deceived and they're demonically influenced. And many of them are demonically possessed even at this point. So this is it's heartbreaking because everyone, and this is something I want us all to, to have in your mind and understand, because I think sometimes it's easy for us to just not even go there. But everyone who dies apart from Jesus, they wake up in hell. They're going to wake up in hell. 
every Muslim that dies during this stupid holy war is going to wake up in hell. He's not going to wake up with 72 virgins and all that, all those lies. He's going to wake up in hell. Every Jewish person that has rejected Jesus, that does not know Jesus, is going to wake up in hell. All those that belong to a Christian cult, that don't believe that Jesus is God, that believe in another Jesus, when they die, they're going to wake up in hell. Every Buddhist, when they die, they're going to wake up in hell. Every Catholic that does not know the Jesus of the Bible is going to wake up in hell. Every Hindu is going to wake up in hell. All those that do not assign to any religion, all the nuns, they're going to wake up in hell. Those are very harsh things to say. That is that is not um, a very tolerant thing to say, people would say. But the thing is, that's the truth. And so the enemy doesn't want you to say the truth because he doesn't want people to understand that this is truly life and death. And not just in Israel, but right here at home. People are dying every day, day that do not know Jesus and as horrible as the tribulation will be, that's one mercy of the tribulation. That after the rapture and during the tribulation, there will be a revival like no other. People are going to wake up and they are going to come to Jesus. It's going to be real. And that's mercy. Because I would much rather you know, have a short time of hell on earth and eternity with Jesus than a short time of easy living here on earth and eternity in hell. And, you know, I think sometimes we just, we, we want to be so politically correct, but that's the truth of the matter. So the enemy's second tactic is this woke narrative and this woke narrative is getting is getting crazy um satan has his own tactics to battle people as they wake up see satan knows that people are waking up and so he has his counterfeit of woke you know we've got waking up to the reality that the bible's real and there's this whole movement of woke and woke is a false sense of being wise in your own understanding. You figured it out. Satan uses this distrust many have of authority and gives fake narratives that sound reasonable. They may even be partly true. They may even be a completely true narrative that doesn't matter. You know, there's all kinds of horrible, evil things that are happening in the world that people can go down that rabbit hole and they can champion straight to hell. Because it doesn't actually matter biblically. It's not going to save you. And so these rabbit holes are so juicy that people get lost in them. They get obsessed with them. And all Satan really cares about is that people are not walking, are not waking up to the truth of the Bible. That's all he really cares about is that people aren't looking in the Bible. So we see this today in all kinds of conspiracies against the narrative. You know, we've got we've got near we've got conspiracies that are true. We got the spoiler alerts. We've got the conspiracies that are false, and they're very difficult to tell the difference between. And even some that are true, like I said before, they don't really matter because they're still just a rabbit hole to get you away from a biblical worldview. So instead of looking to God for what's happening. And what this means biblically, meaning from the Bible, not from a self-proclaimed prophet. Biblically does not mean a self-proclaimed prophet. Biblically means you yourself are actually reading the Bible. They're being snared by this Israel versus Palestine debate. Um, biblically, this is this is really a non-issue, Israel versus Pal um, Palestine, because who does the land belong to? It belongs to God. God, even these pictures right here, God literally put his name on it. He signed Jerusalem 
And he signed the valleys here. He signed his name on this land. He said, this is the place where I'm going to put my name. And he literally put his name, um, the shine. He put his name there. Who does the land belong to? It belongs to God. And God gave it to Israel. That means nobody, not even Israel, has the right to give the land up or to split the land. That's why God is so mad. And Zechariah 14 um, when Jesus comes back, he is livid because they divided his land. He's mad at the nations for forcing Israel to do that. So the land of Israel, this is a non-issue, but we're still going to talk about it here because it is important to understand that they have always been in the land because there are some crazy conspiracies out there that Israel is in Israel. Well, that's ridiculous. The land of Israel has been populated by Jewish people since 2000 BC. And so we're going to look at the timeline here. Um, God gave them this land in 1900 BC. Abraham was chosen by God and given the promised land. And then Isaac, Abraham's son, the promise was passed to him. Genesis 26, 3. And then 1850 BC, Jacob, the son of Isaac, the promise is passed to him. Genesis 35. 1400 BC, Moses leads the people out of Egypt and back to Israel. As remember, they had been taken to Egypt because of the famine. And so, and then 1010 BC, King David unites the tribes into one nation. That's in 2 Samuel. And then 970 BC, King Solomon, the son of David, builds the first temple in Jerusalem. And we see that in 1 Kings. 930 BC, Israel is divided into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, and the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom. And King, 1 Kings and 1 Chronicles um, gives more information on that. Um, in the 800s BC, the rise of the prophets, God's messengers. All this is happening in Israel. Then the kingdom of Israel is conquered by the Assyrians. 1 Chronicles 5 and 2 Kings 17. In 605 BC, the kingdom of Judah is conquered by the Babylonians. And you see that in 2 Kings. This is when Judah went into the 70-year Babylonian exile. But understand that even during the 70-year Babylonian exile, Jews still remained in Israel during that whole time. There were some Jews that were still there the whole time. Solomon's temple is destroyed by the Babylonians. And then um, in 539 BC, Persia conquered the Babylonians and they took control of Israel. Still, there are remnants of Israel in Israel the entire time. The Jews returned to Israel from exile. This is them as a whole. Ezra and Nehemiah um, give detail. The temple is rebuilt, the book of Ezra. And then 450 BC, reforms are made by Ezra and Nehemiah. 433 BC, Malachi is the end of the prophetic age. It's the last book of the, the Old Testament. And then 432 BC, the last group of Jews are returning from exile. So during that whole time, they're still there. 333 BC, the Greeks conquer the Persian, ex, um, the Persian Empire. And so this is still Israel, but... It's, but you see now the world governments are occupying and are taking power over. It, but the people are still in Israel. The Egyptian and Syrian empire take over Israel. Again, Israel still Israel. Um, they recapture Israel and the Jews are ruled independently. Then you got 70 BC. This is BC. The Romans conquer Israel. And then 20 BC, King Herod builds the third temple or the second temple, but it was um, it was built um, more onto it. So and then 6 BC, or I think it's probably more 4 BC, Jesus is born in Bethlehem. 70 AD, the Romans destroy the temple. And so understand during this this entire 2000 years that we that we've been looking at, um, actually, this entire 4,000 years that, that we're going to look at, Israel has been there the entire time. Israel, the Jewish people, have been in their land to some degree the entire time. 
The people were captives to the Romans, the Byzantines, the Arabs, and the Crusaders. Through all of these events, the Jewish people continued to live in Israel to some extent. There were more or less of them, depending on the centuries, but there was never a time when the Jews did not live in the land. They stayed, they built their communities, and they raised their families. They practiced their faith, and they suffered at the hands of many outside rulers, but they always kept their faith. They protected the oracles of God and the customs that God had given them like he had not told them to do. And this is what sustains them even now. That's one reason why their language wasn't completely lost. You know, they're the only nation that's come back after being dispersed twice and brought back a dead language. Why? Because they were still there to an extent. So in 1948, the UN established the state of Israel, the nation of the Jews. Don't buy the Palestinian lie that they were entitled to the land. It just is not true. Yahweh, God, will also provide a way for his chosen people to live in Israel as he has for thousands of years and pray for the people of Israel. And, and he will. And, and God tells us, we know the end of the story. When Jesus comes back, the borders are stated in Ezekiel. The borders during the millennial reign. The temple will be rebuilt. The temple will be there. Um, the Jews will be the priest that work in the temple, the Levi, the, um, uh, the, the, Z oh, is it the Zadoks? I forget. I'm probably butchering who it is, but there is a family line that are going to be the priest. And in Ezekiel, you even see the allow uh, the allotments for the land. They're going to finally have the full amount of land that God gave them during the millennial reign. God is not forfeiting any of his promises. And so what's going to happen next? The Bible says what's going to happen. In a nutshell, Israel will continue to be hated. They're going to continue to be surrounded and their land divided until they're at the brink of extinction under the Antichrist. And then at just the last minute, Jesus is going to return to save Israel. And at that time, all of Israel will be saved. It'll be about a third of Israel that'll still be alive at that time and all of them will be saved. They will inhabit the full boundaries that God gave them for the first time and they will serve God during the millennial reign of Jesus. That is what is going to happen. So now we have tactic number three of the enemy. Israel isn't really Israel. This is probably the tactic that just gets under my skin so, so bad because it's misusing scripture and that really bothers me. Um, but the enemy loves to confuse with scripture. He loves to use God's own word against Christians um, because Christians aren't reading their Bible. So don't be fooled. Satan knows scripture and he always knows. He also knows that most Christians do not really read the Bible so they're easily confused by taking scripture out of context. And so one example of this is the synagogue of Satan in Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. I've seen this used recently. Um, and so I wanted to address it here. The synagogue of Satan is mentioned twice in Revelation, once in Jesus's letter to Smyrna, and then once um, in his letter to Philadelphia. So in both cases, the synagogue of Satan is opposed to the gospel of Jesus. The point that Jesus is making isn't that these biological Jews are not biological Jews or that the promises made to Abraham are no longer in effect, but that true Judaism will acknowledge their king. So Jesus is referring to literal groups that were opposing the gospel during that time. And again, that's why it's so important to take the book of Revelation and to take the entire Bible literally when you can, when it's there's some places where it's just obvious that it's not literal. If you can take it literal, it's literal. These scriptures have been distorted. Um, if, so they've been distorted in two main ways. One, that the Jews today are not the biological descendants of Jacob. Um, you see this a lot, which is, and really this is just an ignorant theory. This is just silly um, because there's always been, like we just saw, there's always been a remnant that remained in Israel. Even when they were dispersed during the Babylonian exile and after 70 AD, 
a remnant has always remained. And today, they can, through DNA evidence, decipher even what tribe someone is from. So it's ridiculous to say that the Jews aren't biological Jews. And then the second one is because they rejected Jesus, the promises God made to them have now been given to the church. So this is replacement theology and it is evil. I mean, it's from the depths of hell evil and it seeped into most churches today to some degree, you know, maybe not um, overtly, but it seeped in to some degree. And so scripture plainly teaches against this. So here we know from Romans 11 that the Jews and all of Israel have been blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. They've been blinded in part until the rapture. And so that's why one reason, you know, when we look and we see what's happening in Israel right now, it's really heartbreaking because they're still blinded in part. We really have to get out of the way so they see what all this is about. They're on the cusp of building their third temple. They're on the, they're here come April or before they're going to sacrifice the red heifer. They're right there at that moment. Um, but they're still blinded in part as long as we're here. They're blinded in part until the fullness of the rapture, um, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So the Jews in general have been cut off from their understanding. They're blinded. But there will come a time when this will change and God will keep his promises to Israel. And, and Paul talks about this in Romans 11. Here, starting in verse 23. And if they, this is Israel, do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in for God is able to graft them in again. Oh, here we go. Is God done with Israel? No, he is able to graft them in again. For if you, a wild olive tree, contrary to nature, were grafted into one that's cultivated, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? He's going to graft them back in. He's always told all throughout scripture. Read all of scripture. He has told you he's going to graft them back in. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you will not be conceited. And that's what happened to a lot of the church today. It's gotten conceited. A hardening in part has come to Israel until the full number of Gentiles has come in. Until the rapture. And so all of Israel will be saved. As it's written, the deliverer will come from, from Zion and he will remove godlessness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And so he is not done with Israel. He's going to save Israel. So is God done with Israel? Absolutely not. Most of the persecution in the New Testament um, was from the Jewish community. And human nature, and we see this in those wise fools today, they want to say, see, God's done with Israel. And now the church takes everything that he gave to her. You have to so distort and warp God's word. You have to so extra spiritualize it and completely take it out of context to do that. You have to completely butcher the word of God to do that. Uh, but understanding that's not God's character. He isn't spiteful like us. He is above all of this, and he wasn't surprised by it. Before God chose Israel, don't you think he knew what they were going to do? He chose them anyway. He wasn't blind to that. He knew. Romans 11, starting in 11, I asked them, this is Paul, have they stumbled so as to fall? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. On the contrary. By their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. God saved us to make them jealous. What do you think when we're raptured? I think that's going to make Israel jealous. When God takes his bride and it's not them, he's going to work another seven years to bring them in. You see that beautiful parallel there with Jacob. He's going to work another seven years to bring in. Israel. 
Now, if their transgression brings riches to the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fullness bring? Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles, and so far as I'm the apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If I might somehow make my own people jealous and save some of them, for if their rejection brings reconciliation to the world, what will the acceptance mean but life from the dead? And think about that. When their acceptance comes, that's when Jesus returns. That's when we return with him. That's when the new, that's when the millennial reign begins. So when Israel, when will Israel accept Jesus? They're going to accept Jesus after the rapture. The scales are going to start to fall off their eyes after the rapture. Um, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, that you'll be conceited. A hardening has happened to Israel until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. And so all of Israel is going to be saved at that time. Um, now, this will be when he returns. There's going to be seven years for them to wake up and for them to come to this. But that's going to begin after the rapture. All Israel will accept Jesus as a result of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 37. Alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And so this time that they're about to go into is the worst ever, but they will be saved out of it. So the final thought here, earth is preparing for war. You know, we're seeing that. It's, it's not just Israel. We're seeing Russia and China and North Korea and, and um, Iran and, and Turkey and we're seeing this world war. Earth is preparing for war, but heaven is preparing for a wedding. God um, uses us in these last moments to share Jesus with the world. And um, so we want to be used to share with the lost, to share with those that are dead around us um, who he is. First Peter 3.15 but in your heart, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give a defense to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that's in you. But respond with gentleness and respect. And so, you know, this wake up call going on with Israel, people are going to ask questions that wouldn't normally ask questions. And we need to be ready to give a defense. We need to be ready to say why we believe what we believe and be encouraged. This is biblical. All this is biblical. But be sober and pray for Israel and the lost to wake up. Stay awake, not woke. <laughs> Keep away from vain conspiracies. There are a lot of vain conspiracies. There's a lot of little rabbit holes you can go down. What's the use? What's the point? All you really need to do is know your Bible better and better and better because that's where the battleground is. Um, Isaiah 8, 12 through 13, don't call everything a conspiracy as they do, as they do. There's more conspiracies out there. And trust me, they're fun. I understand conspiracies can be spoiler alerts. I get it. But right now it's detrimental. We, we need to be in the Bible. So don't call everything a conspiracy as they do. And don't live in dread of what frightens them. Don't be scared. There's no reason for us to be scared. Um, really, there's just absolutely no reason for us to be scared right now. Make the Lord of heaven's armies in your life. Let, make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. He is the one you should fear. He is the one who should make you tremble. Isaiah 8, 12 through 13. And so this was, um, this was a look here on the new anti-Semitism. And why every Christian, every believer should care about Israel and should be praying for Israel right now. Thank you and God bless you.